So today I'm going to draw upon the work of uh, Margaret Hicken and uh, Hetty Lee to think about health um, and illness. Um, uh, and often when we think about um, um, health and illness, um, we think about sort of medicine or public health. And in this section, we're going to talk specifically about the insights provided by sociologists to these areas. Um, so what it is that sociology can bring. And specifically, we'll think about how health is socially patterned um, and how health is experienced. And so, you know, this will be consistent with many of our other lectures where we um, talk about health or any social phenomenon as something that has patterns. Some people are more likely than other people to experience some things. Um, and so we'll ask why that is the case. So some people are more likely to have higher wages than other people. Um, uh, some people in this section are likely to have better or worse health than other people. And we'll try to make sense of this. Um, and this attempts to bring a series of insights from sociology to epidemiology and to medicine more generally. Um, and, you know, the other reason is not just to show the social patterning, but to understand how health is responsive to um, social forces. So um, how different social phenomena that we've learned about already in this course influence our health. And by studying health, this makes us able to understand how um, particular features of society affect all of us. Um, and um, an example of this, which we'll talk about, is how our status position influences our health. And we'll see this both within human populations and within other primate populations, um, so that um, your position in a status hierarchy matters for the health that you experience. It also matters how unequal the status hierarchy is that you're in. And so looking at different kinds of primates, for example, um, uh, scholars, not social scientists, um, um, but primatologists, have noted that um, um, those primate societies that have more unequal status hierarchies tend to have worse health for those at the bottom. So today, um, we'll, we're going to discuss all of this and try and provide a sociological perspective to health. So just to make some distinctions, um, uh, both uh, epidemiology and sociology describe um, different patterns that you observe within health. Um, uh, but uh, epidemiology focuses on the biomedical mechanisms and health behaviors that result in these patterns. And sociology will focus on the social patterns that underlie these. Both of these are incredibly important. So uh, epidemiological focus on medical and health behavioral aspects of health are essential to understanding health. What are the behaviors um, that are likely to produce certain kinds of health outcomes? And what are the biomedical mechanisms? So what are the things within um, our biology that are producing certain patterns in health? Um, but sociology will focus on aspects of society that may drive patterns in health that we see rather than biomedical uh, mechanisms and human behaviors. It's not that um, sociologists never look at human behavior when thinking about health, they certainly do, um, but they often think about how one's social position uh, will influence those behaviors. What I'd like you to do is not think about this as a boxing match where one side is more correct than the other side, where one group is more right or one group is more foolish and the other group obviously gets things right. It's not a good way to think about um, the range of ideas that are presented to you that may not necessarily be conflictual but have different foci. Instead, I want you to think about this as different approaches that explain different aspects of each phenomenon and that a complete understanding is going to require a bit of both. We'll need to know what the biomedical mechanisms are behind health outcomes, just as we need to know about the social forces behind them. And so um, the focus today on these social forces should not be interpreted as they're more important than the biomedical ones or that the biomedical ones don't matter. Instead, it's that both are required for a more complete understanding and if you want that more complete understanding, you're going to also likely have to open up your mind to some of the biomedical and behavioral elements of that. It just won't be our focus today. So as we move forward, um, uh, 
one of the most sort of dramatic uh, ways of seeing differences in health is to look at the infant mortality rate. And um, I'm going to spend some time um, on this. Uh, 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 and we've mentioned this before in the race lectures about differences in infant mortality rates. And if you look in the United States, um, the infant mortality rate um, is uh, incredibly high among U.S. non-Hispanic Blacks and uh, American Indian and Alaskan Natives. So <clears throat> the U.S. mortality rate among um, uh, uh, non-Hispanic Blacks is uh, or close to 11 per thousand live births. Uh, uh, and um, uh, if you compare this to a place like Slovenia or Iceland or Japan or Finland or Sweden or the Czech Republic or Norway, where it's closer to two, um, you realize that the rate is about five times higher in the uh, U.S. among the black population than it is those entire nations. And this is fairly dramatic. It's, it's fairly astonishing how high. Um, the rate is uh, for uh, American uh, uh, Black and American Indian and Alaskan Natives. It's, um, it's incredibly high. And so this helps reveal something of a social patterning. Um, we also see here uh, that the infant mortality rate um, uh, among U.S. non-Hispanic Blacks is uh, about twice um, the um, rate of whites. So uh, another way of thinking about this is that um, uh, um, children born to black families or black mothers um, are twice as likely to die uh, within um, the first two years of their lives than they are um, uh, in white families. And that reveals a pattern of inequality, a pattern of inequality um, that we need to ask ourselves why something like this is happening. Why is it the case um, that the United States, um, among the developed world, has really kind of the highest infant mortality rate overall? So higher than just about every country, I think every country in Europe, um, uh, and closer to the mortality rate of, say, Chile, um, uh, which is um, uh, considerably poorer than the United States. And so we should ask ourselves, what does this infant mortality represent? If you look at the figure, um, what, it, what it represents to both epidemiologists and sociologists is the very high infant mortality rate. And both researchers from epidemiology and sociology would note um, that different racial groups have different rates of infant mortality. And physicians would focus on some of the biological mechanisms behind this. So what they would say is, what are the different rates of diseases among African-American versus white American mothers? And how might that explain part of this? So for example, um, uh, they would focus primarily, I would say, on hypertension, because there are higher rates of hypertension among black women than there are among white women. And they would probably also look at what prenatal care um, looked like. Um, epidemiologists would similarly focus on prenatal care and healthcare access. And um, epidemiologists would also focus on behaviors. So what are the different behaviors among um, black and white women that might explain this? So are there different ways that black and white women experience their pregnancies or interact with their children in their first year of life? Um, a sociologist would focus on the prenatal care um, and healthcare access, but they would also think about mortality by focusing on the policies surrounding overall reproductive health and, re and reproduction in order to see how policies may influence um, uh, this um, uh, differential outcome that's experienced by Black women. So <clears throat> they would say, well, what we need to know is what are the social policies and what are the patterns of inequality in a society that may explain part of this difference and that may explain some of the biomedical pathways. So um, 
Uh, sociologists would also say, you know, it may be the case that black women are more likely to experience hypertension than white women. But are there reasons for that other than just their physiology? Um, might there be reasons why black women have hypertension at such high rates um, that are social reasons, reasons that could be tied to stress in neighborhoods, that could be tied to higher rates of poverty, that could be tied to all kinds of other things. Again, um, the idea is that it's not a competition to see who's got the, the answer, because for most, I would say almost all social phenomenon, um, there is no answer. There are multiple different answers. There are lots of things that are producing this differential rate of death, infant death, um, among black children as compared to white children, uh, and among Native American and Alaskan Native children as compared to white children. And those lots of things require multiple explanations, from physiological differences like rates of hypertension to social patterns that may explain some of those rates of hypertension, um, to things like healthcare access and access to good prenatal care, um, uh, to other kinds of um, health inequalities and inequalities in a society. And one of the things that um, sociologists may focus on is also the bigger picture here, which is why do um, white Americans have such high rates of um, infant mortality in comparison to everybody else in um, the, the developed world. And one of the explanations may be that um, women are valued less in um, American society than in these other societies. And because women are valued less, um, uh, we don't have a series of health policies that look after them. So um, this should hopefully give you a sense of the ways that um, sociologists, epidemiologists, and physicians think about um, these uh, uh, um, uh, phenomena. Now, um, what sociologists will note fairly consistently when looking at things like health is the social patterning. And by social patterning, one of the kinds of social patterning that we can um, see fairly dramatically is geographic pattern. So um, how it is that people in different places have very different experiences and that those experiences aren't just explained by the people, they're also explained by the place. And this is um, a fundamental sociological insight that we've seen in many different chapters and many of the different discussions that we've had about how place produces modes of interaction and outcomes. If you take the same people and you put them in different places, they will have different kinds of experiences because of the way that space influences us. Um, so an example of this that we spoke about earlier was concentrated poverty. That if you take poor people and you put them in a neighborhood with many other poor people, they will be less likely to be able to transcend the conditions of poverty than if you take poor people and you put them in a different kind of neighborhood. So putting lots of poor people together, concentrated poverty, in some ways concentrates the effects of poverty, particularly the negative effects of poverty. But it's not just the kinds of people that are in spaces. It's also the dynamics of the spaces themselves. Just think for a moment about the different neighborhoods or places that you've lived in and how those facilitate some kinds of interactions and not others. So um, if you've ever lived in a suburban area um, uh, and it didn't have sidewalks, what is the consequence of that? Well, one of the consequences is that you don't really get to see people on the street very much. And so serendipitous encounters are unlikely to happen. Um, the way that you meet someone is by arranging to meet them. And that can create um, bubbles, like small groups, um, where uh, interactions are largely constrained by planning. You also may not meet people um, um, uh, who are very different from you. Um, if you've ever lived in a city that didn't have sidewalks, and many cities don't have sidewalks, um, uh, it has a very different feel than cities that have sidewalks. So um, uh, what does this mean? It kind of means that space is a critical player in our social interactions. The built environment 
the physical dynamics of the places um, uh, that we're in produces certain kinds of social outcomes, both positive and negative. So we can see this kind of dramatically in this slide where um, we look at the infant mortality rate by ward in Washington, DC, and it shows that the death rate among infants is not the same in all areas of the city. So um, uh, we can see that in some areas of the city, the infant mortality rate is um, close to one, and in others, it is 12 and a half. So um, in the very, very light blue uh, areas, it's um, uh, basically one per 10,000. And in um, the darkest uh, areas, um, uh, wards, uh, we can see how it's uh, 11 to 12 and a half. Um, uh, so 12 times higher, uh, 11 to 12 times higher in some areas of the city as compared to others. And these areas of the cities might just be a mile or two apart from one another. So we should ask ourselves, why is this the case? Now, part of the reason is because of the people who live in these different areas. We know that the US is a highly segregated society. And what, what we mean by that is that different kinds of people live in different kinds of places. It is both segregated by race and by class. And as we learned in the urban chapter, um, racial segregation has been declining slightly, but is still incredibly persistent in American life. And class segregation has been increasing over the last four years. So, you know, this points us to questions of how health is socially patterned and socially patterned by place. And um, uh, part of the explanation of these differential rates will be racial segregation, that some uh, um, uh, 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 of these wards are 90% black, for example, and we know that black Americans have higher rates of infant mortality. So ward five is 58% um, African American, um, and ward eight, seven and eight are 92% African American. And that's gonna explain some of why we see this social patterning. But it's insufficient to just look at the composition of people in order to explain these outcomes. What we also um, need to look at is how the resources that women may require for a healthy life and also for a healthy pattern are different in the different spaces that they live in. This is the question of health access. Access to healthy food is important for health throughout one's life, and particularly during one's pregnancy. So too is access to public transportation, so the capacity to move throughout the city and um, uh, experience the city um, uh, as a place where you have access to things like doctor's visits as well as grocery stores. So if we look at Ward 8, um, which has one of the highest infant mortality rates, um, we'll see that there's only one grocery store in all of Ward 8, and there's one farmer's market. If we compare this to Ward 3, which has um, a similar population size, uh, we see that Ward 3 has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine grocery stores. So people in Ward 8, have one grocery store and people in Ward 3 have nine grocery stores, nine times as many grocery stores. And so one, they have access, more easier access to food. Um, and uh, there's a competitive food landscape there. Um, the people in Ward 3 also have multiple farmers markets, uh, by my count, uh, at least four, um, as opposed to one. And so there's significant differences in the spatial experience of place in terms of access to food. But there's also significant differences in terms of access to things like transportation. So if we look in Ward 8, again, there are only two metro stations in Ward 8. Um, ward 3 has five of them. Um, uh, and other wards have significantly more as well. And if you look at this map and you look at Ward 8, hopefully what you'll see is that for some people, the metro station is not at all near their house. It's not at all close to them. Now, why would this matter? Well, among poorer people, for, to be able to get around the city, 
they may not be able to afford a car. If you're living on less than $20,000 a year, a car is incredibly expensive. Um, the maintenance of the car um, would be incredibly expensive. The licensing of the car is expensive. Providing insurance and gasoline for the car is incredibly expensive. A car may not be a viable option for you, uh, given the amount of money that you have. And so you rely upon public transportation. So imagine what it would be like to be a pregnant woman in DC trying to get to a grocery store, the one grocery store in your ward, um, uh, if you don't have access to um, uh, public transportation or poor access, if you live in the southern tip of this ward. What this reveals is um, uh, that part of the spatial patterning here is not just about the kind of people who make up the neighborhood. It, it's also about what the neighborhood is like, what the lived and daily experience of that neighborhood is, and what are the sets of resources flowing through that neighborhood. And if you live in an area where there are fewer resources flowing through your neighborhood, your health is likely to be much worse. This is not just a United States story. Think about slums in different parts of the world. Um, you may have seen images of them. You may have visited them. Um, some of you may have even be, may even be from them. Those neighborhoods are partially places of very poor health because of the people who are there. Because it's they have people who are much poorer who. Um, uh, uh, don't really have access to healthcare, or maybe don't use healthcare because of its costs, again, because of their poverty. And therefore, they experience really poor health. But there's also the question of infrastructure and how the space that they live in, being surrounded by many other poor people, lack of sanitation, lack of access to things like grocery stores, um, transportation, etc., produce some of their ill health. We could also tell this story with rural experiences. So we need not just look at the city, we could also look at rural spaces and ask, how good of an access do people in rural places in the world have to healthcare? What does their access look like? What does their access to food look like? And rural people who live in agricultural spaces may have poor access to food. They may not have access to food that is what you would think because you're like, well, you grow up on a farm, you must have food around you. But they may have very particular kinds of food, very specific foods that aren't actually enough to sustain you in terms of the range of nutrients that you need. And um, things like cars, again, can be very expensive. Um, and there may be uh, social isolation, considerable social isolation. So the insight here is that it's not just people's behaviors that influence their health. It's the web of relations that they're in, the matrix of relations that they're in, and how that relation, those sets of relationships influence them. There's other research, for example, that shows that um, women who live in higher violence neighborhoods, even if they themselves don't experience that violence, are much more likely to have infant mortality or to have children with lower birth weight, which is uh, predictive of um, some negative health outcomes uh, over the course of one's life. And if you're not subject to violence, why does it matter if you live in a violent neighborhood? Well, the explanation I think is pretty obvious, which is stress. Um, that there's a lot of stress that's um, experienced. So um, there's really interesting research that shows that if you live in a building where someone has been murdered, um, it has big impacts on infant mortality rates. Um, and if you live in the building next door, the impacts are still there and they're a little smaller. And if you live at the end of the block, the impacts are still there, but smaller still. And so what's happening around us influences our health and well being all the time. So we need to think about not just how people are behaving, but also what is the context that they navigate their lives. And that's why we look at this thing like the spatial patterning of wards. Um, all of this is to say, and you should feel like I'm a little bit of a broken record at this point um, in time in 
in terms of all of these lectures, <clears throat> that health and illness are socially constructed. Um, by studying the socially patterning of health, we can come to understand health as something that's socially patterned and um, uh, health as something that is thereby socially constructed. Um, and there are a range of social constructions of health. Health and illness have meanings in the US because we give particular meanings to that health. And the meaning of health and illness in the US differs than it does in other societies. So different societies are gonna have different meanings that they associate with health and with illness. And the meanings that we give to health and illness through, the, through basically a range of concepts, which we'll talk about in a moment, are a way that we enforce social control and social order. So think for a moment about socially legitimate illnesses versus socially contested illnesses. Um, I had your friend whose uh, mother was recently um, diagnosed with lung cancer. And one of the things that we were talking about was that the first question almost everyone asked him was, did she smoke? And she didn't smoke. Uh, and there's a particular form of lung cancer that you can get where if you don't smoke, it ends up being highly um, uh, uh, deadly. It's very difficult to recover from. But that question, did she smoke, is partially a question that suggests that the cancer is her fault or not her fault. And that there are legitimate illnesses and illegitimate illnesses. Other examples that you may, might think about are attention deficit, deficit and hyperactivity disorder or other forms of learning disabilities that people contest their legitimacy. Is that really uh, an illness or are people just trying to take advantage of something or find to get more time on their tests? Let me assert that those are legitimate experience, health experiences that people have that require some kind of intervention could be pharmacological, it could be um, counseling, it could be any range of things or accommodations. But often, types of disabilities that people have are subject to questions of the legitimacy of those disabilities. Are they real? Um, uh, and so we see how across many different types of health behaviors and health outcomes, one of the things that we question is whether or not those health behaviors or outcomes are legitimate or contested, whether or not they were deserved or unfortunate. And this is part of a social construction process. It has nothing to do with the disease itself, and it has a lot to do with how we interpret those people who experience diseases. Um, and so, you know, one of the ways that we can see the social construction of health and illness is through what is a socially legitimate versus a contested illness. And contested illnesses are those things that are thought to be due to people's own behaviors. And then the person can be stigmatized and not fully accepted by society. So, for example, if someone has a heart attack, one of the responses could be, well, you know, he was very overweight. Or... I'm so surprised he was so thin. This is a form of interpretation where one looks at the behavior of the person and puts some blame upon them for their stigmatized activity. Another way that we construct the meaning of health and illness is through defining how sick people should behave in order to still be accepted by a society. So what is it that we expect sick people to do in order to perform their sickness properly. Um, and uh, uh, if you have ever yourself experienced mental health challenges, or um, you have family members or friends who have, you may notice what it is that's asked of people who might be experiencing either clinical depression or people who are having depressive episodes. You just have to get out there, you know, try and smile more. Uh, there are things that are asked of people when they have illnesses um, where those things are, um, uh, they're social constructions of how people should behave when they're sick or when they have a particular health experience. So imagine for a moment a pregnant woman 
um, a woman in her uh, uh, you know, third trimester. And that pregnant woman is uh, at lunch with friends and says, you know, I'm gonna have half a glass of wine. In many instances, people will be like, you know, that's fine. It's just half a glass of wine. It's not going to do that much. Imagine, by contrast, that she pulled out a cigarette and said, I'm just going to smoke half a cigarette. Chances are the response would be more extreme, that that's totally illegitimate because it is not how someone with a particular health experience, pregnancy, it's not an illness, but it's a, um, a condition that one is in, should in fact act. And so we construct the meaning of health and illness through defining how people should behave under different health conditions. If a person is ill and the, the illness is not considered to be their own fault, then they should seek the currently accepted medical advice and follow it in order to be fully accepted by society. So one of the critical things that sick people have to do in order to be socially acceptable is to follow the currently accepted medical advice. Now, you may think to yourself, well, of course this is what they should do because this is how they get healthy. But remember that in other periods of time, the currently accepted medical advice could be profoundly harmful for people. So, for example, if you followed the medical advice for um, uh, a sexually transmitted disease, what would the consequence be for you? Well, you'd be consuming mercury and literally killing yourself if you had syphilis. And so um, the socially acceptable thing to do was to follow the medical advice. But the medical advice was not good advice. And in fact, even in your own lifetimes, there have been um, significant revisions in what the medical advice is. My point here is not to say that doctors don't know what they're doing, uh, that medicine is a fool's uh, errand and not really a science and da, da, da. But it is that medicine makes mistakes or that people have good reasons for acting the ways that they do. But if they choose not to follow the expected um, sets of, uh, the accepted, excuse me, sets of medical advice, if they don't follow that, then um, they are not behaving properly as a sick or ill person and we can begin to blame them for their own illness. We also construct illness through medicalization, meaning that we describe everyday experiences um, in medical ways. So when we describe ordinary experiences in medical terms, then these ordinary experiences become a disorder that we need to treat. And experts um, in the medical profession begin to be people who are enlisted. Um, so people may say, I'm depressed. Um, <clears throat> in all likelihood, people who say that are not depressed. Um, depression is a clinical diagnosis that requires meeting a series of criteria. Um, they may be having an, a depressive episode, um, for example, but in general, they're not, um, uh, in, in the vast majority of cases, they're not actually depressed. Um, depression is a very specific and incredibly difficult thing that people experience, and sadness is also something that we experience, but it's not depression. But to describe it as I'm depressed is to medicalize the experience. So rather than saying, I'm sad, I'm a little bit down, I don't know, I'm just not feeling myself. Um, uh, when saying I'm depressed, what we do is we medicalize an everyday experience, say, of sadness, and thereby begin to um, invoke a range of institutions that might help us. So if your friend says to you, I'm depressed, what are the, what are the things that you might respond? The things that I would certainly respond is, have you spoken to anybody? Have you talked to anyone about this experience that you're having? Um, and what that does is it immediately brings in expertise into the conversation. It brings in a group of people, psychologists and psychiatrists, who have the expertise and professional capacity to intervene. It's important to note that each of these three ways um, in which health and illness are socially constructed are differentially applied to different social groups in the United States. So that race, gender, and class are major social forces that alter the definitions and experiences of health and illness. So what is a socially legitimate versus a contested illness, what one should do when one is sick, and how we medicalize everyday experiences um, are affected by race, gender, and class.
think for a moment about uh, the presentation of the material about the infant mortality rates between black and white Americans and ask yourself, did you, in thinking about that, ask, is this socially legitimate or not? Isn't this just because black women are engaging in negative behaviors that are harming their children? What is contesting there? the illness um, that leads to mortality among black infants. One is basically saying it must be black women's fault. They have higher rates of hypertension, higher rates of obesity, this is bad for children. It's kind of their fault. Or think about other things that maybe women who experience pregnancy, who are not sick, but um, who experience a health condition, weren't acting properly. Maybe they didn't get the right prenatal care. Maybe there are things that they did that they, sh they, that they shouldn't have done or things that they should have done that they didn't do. They should have gone to the doctor more frequently. They should have eaten healthier when they were pregnant. They should have dot, dot, dot. Again, the patients didn't act properly. We can see then how race influences our interpretation of what is a socially legitimate versus a contested illness, what it means to say that people have responsibilities when they're ill to act in proper ways and that, it, that those responsibilities are racially informed.